So Amber, tell me a Christmas song that everybody else seems to love, but you cannot stand. Confession time. I really don't like Mary Did You Know. What? I'm sorry, what? Even what? Pesatonics? How, you, how dare you? Well, my least favorite Christmas carol is probably Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <gasps> Why? How dare you? No, no, okay. no. What, what is a hark even? It's like yeet. It's like a verb that doesn't even mean anything. <laughs> what about I want a hippopotamus for Christmas? <laughs> no, but seriously. Okay, so it's always like this serious guy in a suit comes on and it's all dramatic and then he's like, Mary, did you know? Uh, hey! I don't like that one. That's iconic. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. Hear this angel. How dare you No, 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 no. Don't be that person. Oh, come on. It's like all about stuff and what you can get. It's and it's so really it's not really about the, the spirit of Christmas. I like that one. All right, cool. Mary, did you know no, no, that your baby? Stop. Get out! Come on. Get out! <laughs> Not having any of that. Tell us your least favorite Christmas song in the comments below. And did you know that we're delivering over a thousand kids Christmas craft kits all over Calgary on December nineteenth? This is a crazy awesome opportunity to share the Christmas story all over our city, but we need drivers to deliver these kits. Please let us know if you can help by going to connectcalgary.ca slash driver. And today is the last day to place bids on our online auction. All proceeds go towards helping the new construction and purchasing of items on our new building. So you can go check out the amazing auction items at connectauction.ca. You might not know, but there are several Christmas carols in the Bible. This brand new series we're kicking off is called Christmas Playlist, and we're going to be leaning into the power of Christmas through this song. So let's check it out. So as we've seen this morning, Christmas songs can be controversial. Whether it's because they are overplayed, lack good theology, or they're just plain cheesy, we've all got Christmas music that we wish we could ban from being heard. And then on the other hand, we have Christmas songs we love. Songs that remind us of our childhoods and immediately put us in the holiday spirit. I know a couple of people who love Christmas music so much that they listen to it all year long. If you jumped in their car in April, you might just hear Santa Baby playing on the stereo. You know who you weirdos are. Now it might surprise you to know that the Bible actually contains several Christmas songs itself. When we read them, we don't often recognize that they're songs because the words don't rhyme in English and we have no idea what the original melody was like. And yet, like Christmas carols that have been written throughout the centuries, these are beautiful reminders of what Christmas is really about. And they might just help you and me find a bit more holiday cheer in 2020. So today we're kicking off a short series called Christmas Playlist. Each week in this series, we'll look at one of these songs about the birth of Jesus that's found in the scripture. And today we're gonna discuss the very first Christmas song ever written in history. The entire genre started right here in these verses. Who do you think wrote the first Christmas carol ever? The angels, the shepherds, the choir at First Baptist Church, Jerusalem? No, the first Christmas hymn was written by Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the lyrics to her song are going to blow you away. I promise that unless you're really familiar with this passage of scripture, you are not expecting what she's going to say. It is anything but a traditional Christmas carol. In fact, the song she sings is so controversial that at least three times throughout history, the song has been banned from being recited in public for fear it would cause riots. I'm totally serious. What could she have possibly said that was so inflammatory? How could Christmas music start revolutions? Well, let's find out. Mary's song is found in Luke chapter number one. Historically, it's been called the Magnificat because magnify is the first word of the song in Latin. Now, you probably know some of this story. Mary had been visited by an angel who told her that she would miraculously conceive a son who would be the Messiah. Mary is so confused by this message that she goes to visit her older cousin Elizabeth in the Judean countryside to kind of process it all. 
When she arrives, before Mary has had a chance to even tell her cousin that she's pregnant, the Holy Spirit moves Elizabeth to prophesy that Mary's child is the Messiah. And in that moment, Mary realizes it's all true. I mean, how else would Elizabeth have known that she was pregnant? Remember, this was only a couple of days after the angel visited Mary. Her pregnancy wasn't visible. Heck, she hadn't even missed a period yet. And it's in this moment that Mary spontaneously begins to sing a song, a song that set the standard for all other Christmas songs to follow, a song that can completely transform how you view Christmas if you'll allow it to. So in Luke chapter number one, verse 46, Mary begins, my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. He has shown mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Okay. Maybe it's not as catchy as all I want for Christmas, but it would have sounded different in Aramaic, the language that they all spoke. Maybe it rhymed. I'm sure it had a great melody behind it. Mary's song starts off with some pretty typical things that we hear in every Christmas carol, right? The greatness of God, a virgin conception, blessings on all people. But by the time you get to the back half of the song, Mary has completely left the holiday script and she sounds more like a political revolutionary. I mean, what gives? Why is this song written the way that it is? Well, there are two major themes running through her words here, and these are truths that are at the heart of what Christmas is really all about. Reading her lyrics, we were reminded that first, Christmas is a season to focus on God and not our circumstances. Look, if I were in Mary's shoes, I'd be talking about my circumstances a lot. I'd be wondering how this was going to impact my life and which of my plans would have to change after hearing the big announcement. Honestly, I'd be very afraid of what other people would say. I mean, I know there would be rumors and probably some people who would shun me. If I were her, I'd be super concerned about how my fiance would react. Would he call off the engagement? Would he trust me ever again? If I thought about it long enough, I, I might even start trying to figure out like why God would choose me. I mean, I must be a, a pretty good person. I must be more spiritual than I realized to be selected for this, for this role. I mean, I would become pretty self-absorbed by the whole situation. But Mary doesn't do that. Rather than focusing on herself, she focuses on God. During the 10 verses of her song, Mary mentions God 16 separate times and herself only twice. Mary knows that she is not the central character in this story. And while her circumstances are so unbelievable that people will be talking about them for thousands of years into the future, she never mentions her situation once. Mary doesn't magnify herself or her situation, she magnifies God. Hey, this Christmas, we should follow her example. It's so easy for our focus to shift during the holiday season. We're concerned with buying the perfect presents and having a tree worthy of Pinterest. We can get easily consumed with family gatherings and travel. Well, okay, like travel in a normal year. Our schedules fill up and our bank accounts drain down. And a month that is supposed to be full of cheer and gratitude turns into a season of anxiety and pressure. And look, 2020 is only making things worse. As things stand right now, we likely won't be getting together with family for Christmas celebrations. Are we going to have to forego dinner with Nana this year? Who knows? Some of our families are going to pressure us to gather beyond our comfort level or beyond the local rules that are in place. You may have people in your life who are battling COVID right now, or perhaps your income has been negatively impacted during the pandemic and you can't give your kids the Christmas that you want to. Maybe lockdowns, masks, contested elections, and even more are making it harder than ever for you to enjoy Christmas. This December, 
you'll have even more pressure than normal to magnify your circumstances. But instead, let's follow Mary's example and magnify God. See, I can make a big deal out of myself or I can make a big deal out of God, but I can't do both. Christmas offers us the chance to reset and recenter our lives around what truly matters, God's presence and love, no matter our current circumstances. So this morning, ask yourself honestly, what is causing me anxiety this Christmas? In what ways am I magnifying that situation? In what ways am I making it bigger than it really is? And rather than magnifying my circumstances, how can I instead magnify God? How can I focus on Him beyond all else? Now, before we move on to the second half of Mary's prayer, I think we should probably pause for just a moment to talk about Mary herself. Because in some churches, they make a big deal out of Mary. You might have been to some of them. Perhaps in those churches, you were told to pray to Mary or to light candles in honor of Mary. You may have even felt like you were supposed to worship the mother of Jesus. And certainly Mary is a special woman. In verse 48 of her song, she says that all generations will call her blessed. When the angel Gabriel appeared to her to announce her pregnancy, he said that she was highly favored by God. But even with all of that, it's important to remember that Mary did not magnify herself. She magnified God. The Christmas carol she wrote wasn't about the mother of Jesus. It was about the capital F father of Jesus. I believe if she saw us celebrating her, she would say like, wait, you're missing the point. This story isn't about me, it's about God. If you're gonna magnify anybody, it should be him. And you know, Jesus himself said basically the same thing many years later. In Luke chapter number 11, verses 27 to 28, we read, as Jesus was speaking, a woman in the crowd called out, God bless your mother, the womb from which you came and the breasts that nursed you. Now, if God had intended for us to venerate Mary, Jesus would have said, yes, indeed, mama was the goat. But he doesn't say that. Instead, Jesus replied, even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Now, look, Jesus is not denying that Mary was a very special woman. She was, and she deserves honor. But the honor we give her should never replace the honor that we give to Jesus. We need to be really careful that the respect we give to Mary, or anyone else for that matter, never becomes the worship that is due to God alone. Okay, back to the Christmas song here. Mary's lyrics so far have certainly been powerful, and I believe they're helpful. But we haven't discussed what would cause a government to make it illegal to perform the song in public. While there are a lot of themes in these lyrics that we might find in a typical Christmas song, there are also some that I don't think appear in any other Christmas music at all, particularly verses 51 through 53. Let me read that section to you again. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He's brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, and he has sent the rich away with empty hands. Not exactly a simple song about a sweet baby and barnyard animals, is it? Throughout history, people have recognized the power in these words. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a German theologian. He was executed by the Nazis in World War II. And he wrote, the Magnificat is the most passionate, wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung. Most artistic depictions of Mary throughout history have looked a little something like this, Madonna and her child. But after reading the Magnificat, a man named Ben Wildflower created this artistic piece, which I honestly think is one of the dopest ideas for a tattoo I've seen in a long time. How cool is this? It was these words that Mary spoke, and he highlights here, that so upset the Indian and Argentinian governments that they outlawed this song completely. They were afraid it would foment insurrection among their people. Now look, I don't think that Mary is necessarily advocating for class warfare here, okay? However, she is highlighting another one of the primary things we are supposed to learn from the Christmas story. God almost never does what we expect him to do. In our world, things operate according to a pretty standard formula. The strong have power and the weak do not. We believe it is a blessing to be wealthy and a curse to be poor. We assume that most religious people are the ones who are the closest to God. 
So with all of that in mind, when God sent his son into the world, you would probably expect him to be born to a powerful family, one that was wealthy and had connections. You would expect them to be super religious or hyper political, but instead God chooses a poor, unmarried teenage girl in some backwoods part of the Roman Empire. The Jewish people were expecting the Messiah to be a warrior, and instead God sent a baby. They thought he would be a general, and instead he was a carpenter. They thought God would send a priest, and instead God sent a sacrifice. Christmas is the world's ultimate reminder that God operates on a different economy than we do. That means the things that we think are a benefit are often a hindrance, and the things that we think are a curse are often a blessing. God almost never does what we expect Him to do, and that is really good news. Because it means you don't have to be wealthy or powerful or religious or male or young or white. None of the things that our world seems to prioritize. God is looking for different kinds of people, and He's putting them on different kinds of paths altogether from what we expect. You know, it's been said that God works in mysterious ways, but I'm not so sure that that's true. I think it's more accurate to say that God works in unexpected ways. It's not that God does things we can't understand, it's that he does the opposite of what we would expect him to do in most situations. Nowhere is this more true than when it comes to our salvation. God doesn't save good people, he saves sinful people. God doesn't accept religious people. He calls religious people to repent of their religion. God doesn't ask us to earn our salvation. He asks us to admit that we cannot earn it and instead to receive it as a free gift from Him. Everything God does is counterintuitive and even shocking. But the irony is that the Christmas season has become one in which we've lost the revolutionary sense of God's plan. We've tamed it. We've commodified it. We've accepted the first half of Mary's song and we've ignored the second half. We've made this holiday about nostalgia instead of awe. We've settled for tradition instead of reveling in the miraculous. Mary's song shocks us with its language, but the entire Christmas story is supposed to be shocking. Like her song is so brilliant because the lyrics themselves are shocking, but even the structure, which starts out exactly how you would expect and then veers so far away from what you would expect, many churches just ignore this passage altogether. Wow. So this December, let's not try to recover the magic of Christmas. You know, that's just a marketing slogan designed to get you to buy a new TV anyway. Don't even worry about getting into the holiday spirit. Instead, allow yourself to be shocked by the story. This was not a silent night. Let's be real about the fact that in our world, not all is calm and bright. There are injustices that need to be addressed and traditions that need to be let go of and a work of God that we need to embrace. Let's recover the revolutionary nature of Christmas in which our circumstances may be overwhelming, but the love and power of God is overflowing. Father, today we celebrate you. We say thank you for recording this song for us to read so many thousands of years later. It is a challenge and a blessing, and God, we embrace it, and God, we allow it to search our hearts and souls and to confront the parts of our lives in which, God, we've settled into tradition and routine, in which we've overlooked the mission and plan that you've given to each one of us. And God, I just pray that Mary's words, her lyrics, they would stir something deep inside of us that would cause us, first of all, God, to focus on you during the Christmas season so that you are the thing that matters most, not gatherings, not gifts, not what we're missing out on, not our fears, but you alone are what fills our thoughts and minds during this very special season. And God, I pray that the lyrics of this song would challenge us to recover the revolutionary nature of Christmas. That God, we would see how unexpected and challenging and exciting and frustrating it all is that we would need a savior and that that savior would come as a baby and that baby would go on to to redeem us not by by fighting a battle, not by winning political power, but instead by dying in our place 
all of this is so unexpected, God. And I pray that during this season, we would recover the shocking nature of the gospel, the beauty of your love for each and every one of us. Help us not to settle for a cheap imitation like Christmas cheer or holiday spirit. Lord, help us to fully embrace the true reason for this season. We love you and we thank you for your plans and for your presence. In the name of Christ, our Savior, amen. In his message, Pastor Dan mentioned that you can make a big deal out of yourself or you can make a big deal out of Jesus, but not both. Friends, today you have a choice. Will you choose to exalt yourself as the Lord over your own destiny? Or will you give Jesus control over your life? Will you kneel at his feet and humbly ask him to be the king of your heart? If you choose Jesus today, we want you to know that you are not alone. We want to pray with you, give you a Bible, and support you as you take this leap of faith. So text FAITH to 587-600-2055 and one of our staff members will reach out to you shortly. Let us be the church family that you need. Now speaking of families, our church family has a new home. But as you know, moving, renovating, and rebuilding comes with a steep price tag. Connect Church has been hosting an online auction this weekend to offset these costs. We have amazing friends and businesses across the city and abroad who have donated to this auction. Today is the very last day to get in on this. Trust me guys, you do not want to miss out. Head over to www.connectauction.ca and bid on your favorite items. Bidding ends at 10 p.m. tonight. This auction is a special event for the purpose of entering our new church home, but Connect Church runs on your regular giving. Thank you for your generous giving during this season. It is because of you that we are able to give Christmas craft kits to families who are stuck at home this Christmas. Because of you, Connect Church is now a part of over a thousand children's Christmas tradition this year. You and your giving, it's making a difference. Go to connectcalvary.ca slash give and give today. That's it from us today, but before you get back to your regularly scheduled programming, come join us on Zoom right now for our after party. The link is now in our chat below. Come with your bed head, with your babies, or with your breakfast. We look forward to seeing you. Live life overflowing. And it's like this deep voice and ridiculous and I just don't like...